Good evening, Thank you. ladies and gentlemen. It's nice to see a full house. Uh, my name is Farah Kiladar and I'm the CEO of the World Affairs Council. It's wonderful to see you all. Uh, I'd just like to make a couple of comments before we uh, progress with tonight's event. I know that a number of you were unable to attend our George Mitchell program, including myself, which was very unfortunate because it uh, coincided with Yom Kippur as well as the beginning of Eid. We did live stream it to try and uh, provide it to more people and actually I think we had about 80 people calling in. And it is also recorded on our website. So please, if you go on our website, you'll see most of our events are recorded on there, including this one, which I am sure you're going to want to be able to tell people to listen to after you listen to our speaker today, Muna. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to recognize that we have quite a large number of students attending. So if students please stand up to be recognized. Going on to our speaker for the evening, um, some of you would have met Mona. She has been to Houston twice before. Um, she, to some extent, needs no introduction. But nevertheless, she uh, is a winning Egyptian-American journalist uh, and columnist. Um, she most recently started calling herself an activist. Um, her essays and op-eds uh, could be read in the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, Christian Science Monitor, and many others. She's also been a commentator on CNN, NPR, and MSNBC, and uh, others. Today, she'll be talking about her new book, uh, which she was just signing in the back, Headscarves and Hymens, Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. To say the least, it's a controversial title, and my guess is that was the intent. Um, it seeks to inspire anger. In fact, I offered to take Mona for a drink before this, and she said she needs to remain angry. Leave the drinks afterwards. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Mona to the podium. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Farah, and the World Affairs Council of Houston. You guys seem to like me, because this is the third time I've been here, so thank you. I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'm going to start with um, a small reading from my book, and then I'll have another smaller reading afterwards. And this reading, um, I mean, the, every chapter in my book begins with an epigram from a feminist that I admire and whose work has inspired me. And I'm beginning this chapter which I call the God of Virginity, with a quote from one of the many books that Dr. Nawal Saadawi, an icon of Middle Eastern and global feminism, wrote in one of her books. And this is actually the 30th anniversary of uh, the publication of the first of Nawal's books. I've interviewed her in Cairo several times, and she's a fantastic icon for feminism. And as you'll see from this quote, what she writes um, ties in, dovetails very nicely with what I, I'm here to speak to you about. So this is the chapter called The God of Virginity. Arab society still considers that the fine membrane which covers the aperture of the external genital organs is the most cherished and most important part of a girl's body and is much more valuable than one of her eyes or an arm or a lower limb. An Arab family does not grieve as much at the loss of a girl's eye as it does if she happens to lose her virginity. In fact, if the girl lost her life, it would be considered less of a catastrophe than if she lost her hymen. Noella Sadawi, The Hidden Face of Eve. This is me speaking now. Our hymens are not ours. They belong to our families. This truth was brought home to me one evening in Amsterdam after I'd taken part in an event on the rights of Muslim women. In a conversation that evening, probably the first about sex I had had with fellow Arab or Muslim women, a Dutch Moroccan woman told me and a group of her friends, quote, when I first had sex, it was as if my mother, my father, my grandparents, the entire neighborhood, God and all the angels were there watching, <laughs> end quote. We all convulsed with laughter. 
It was a relief to talk to women who still understood the burden of virginity and the guilt involved in shedding it, women who did not judge. It was a relief to talk to women who would never ask, how could you not resist, as the nurse in the ER asked me when I told her I'd been sexually assaulted. I actually resisted for a long time, too long, I believe now when I look back. I guarded my hymen like a good virgin until I was 29. I accepted and obeyed what I was taught by my family who in turn were taught by their parents no sex until marriage. Now, when I think about how long I waited to have sex, I'm sad for my younger self and sad that I waited so long to experience and enjoy something that gives me so much pleasure. Back then though, during all those years that I waited and waited, it would terrify me to even consider sex before marriage. I was taught by my family, by school, by religion, by society, and I obeyed. I'd been trained well and I was a good girl to the end. My hymen was protected from my feminism, which wrestled with my headscarf, but not with my hymen. Why? Why did I obey and why did I wait so long to finally disobey? Those questions kept coming up again and again in, of all places, Oklahoma. There, in a University of Oklahoma lecture room, where I was teaching a course on gender and new media in the Middle East in 2010, I began publicly to share my reckoning with the god of virginity. How do you discuss virginity with a class of American university students without the conversation sounding irrelevant to their lives, or worse, like an exercise in exoticizing another culture? Women, sex and culture form a Bermuda Triangle in which open discussion tends to run off course through either defensiveness, when students feel compelled to defend a cultural practice, or superiority, when they feel compelled to parade their culture as being above whatever cultural challenges are being discussed. The personal is not only political, it demolishes this Bermuda Triangle. I received a powerful reminder about how much easier the personal makes it to discuss problems over there after I showed my class the Lebanese film Caramel, in which director Nadine Labaki plays the owner of a Beirut hair salon whose friends and co-workers portray a cross-section of the Lebanese female experience. One of the friends undergoes hymen reconstruction just before her wedding to a man she fears will reject her if he finds out she isn't a virgin. At first, some students express shock that the woman could not share her sexual history with her future husband, while others wondered why it was such a big deal that she was no longer a virgin. I reminded the class that until the 1960s, virginity was a big deal in the United States too. Have you heard of purity balls, asked one young woman in the class, referring to formal dances in the United States between fathers and daughters at which teenage girls pledged to remain virgins until marriage. Such balls underpin purity culture in the United States. Yes, I thought, now virginity was over here. I had indeed heard of purity balls through news articles, but they seemed as foreign to me and to the class as hymen reconstruction, until the personal shook us out of our complacency. I just want everyone to know that I signed a purity pledge with my father, one of the students said. This was 2010. I could not have engineered it better myself. Her courage and sharing reminded us all that virginity wasn't just far away in Lebanon or in newspaper feature stories, it was right in class with us. Oklahoma kept doing that to me. I joked that going there was like going to the Middle East. <laughs> A similar mix of religion and conservative politics prevailed. Watching the way the US religious right wing has managed to erode women's reproductive rights, especially in the South, I was struck by how important and courageous feminist and reproductive rights activists in those southern states are. Some of the other students tiptoed around asking questions of the student who had shared her purity pledge experience. I respect that you think you've made a free choice, one student told her, but the playwright Eve Ensler said that when you sign a pledge to your father, your sexuality has been taken away from you until you sign it to your husband when you get married. Teaching is like alchemy. You take a few students, mix in some difficult subjects, and you're bound to be stunned by the results. I make my classes as personal as possible. I offer my experiences to keep a face on the issue we're talking about, so the least I could do to show my appreciation for the generous sharing we had all witnessed and to express solidarity with a conservative position I once shared was to tell the class how long I had waited to have sex. There were no purity pledges in my past, but there was a time when I too believed I should wait till I get married before I had sex. 
But then it took forever to get married and I got fed up waiting. <laughs> so, before I talk, before I begin my talk, um, I want to explain to some of you why I look so different from the last time you saw me, because I've been here twice before. And then the last time I was here was in, um, I think, April or May of 2011. We were euphoric with revolutionary spirit and zeal in Egypt. And I had come to share some of that euphoria and zeal with you. And I went back to Egypt for the first time since the revolution began, because at the time I lived in New York, in July of 2011, and I spent some time there and took part in a sit-in in Tahrir. And then I went back again in November. I actually wasn't supposed to be back there until much later in December for parliamentary elections. But these amazing protests erupted in a street called Muhammad Mahmoud, which is now an icon of the Egyptian revolution. And Muhammad Mahmoud Street is actually the street where my university, my alma mater, the American University in Cairo, used to be. It's now out in, in the desert in New Cairo, but I used to go to university there every day. And I was following these protests between the revolution and the security services. I was in Morocco at the time. And all I could do was cry and be in awe at the courage of the young men and women on that street. And I would hear incredible stories, like for example, 12-year-old boys would go and fight the security services on this street to protect Tahrir, because they had gone to Tahrir and beaten up families of the martyrs and burnt tents. So you had boys as young as 12 who would go onto Muhammad Mahmoud Street and fight the security services. And they would write on their forearms the numbers of their mother's telephone, so that if they ended up in the morgue dead, unidentified, people could call that number and tell their mother they had died. And I would also hear stories of a young woman on that same street fighting the police and the army and a much older man coming up to her and asking her, why are you here? And she told him, I'm here to fight for the revolution. And he told her, you're young and educated and we need people like you. I'm old and uneducated and I will die here. And after I die, I need people like you to lead Egypt. And I would read all these stories and just cry. And I thought, I have to go back. So instead of going to the European Parliament, where I was supposed to go and give a talk in Brussels, I cancelled my trip and I went to Cairo, and I went to Mohammed Mahmoud. And some of you might know that I was assaulted by the riot police there. A friend of mine and I were entrapped by plainclothes security. And they took my friend to, so they, they surrounded me and took my friend across the street, where they held his hands behind his back and beat him. He needed stitches the next day. And they beat him at a place where he could see what they were doing to me across the street. And across the street, I was surrounded by four Egyptian riot police who beat me and broke my left arm and my right hand. And then they took me to a no man's land where they sexually assaulted me. And then they took me to their supervising officer who also threatened to have me gang raped. And then I was detained for six hours by the interior ministry and six hours by military intelligence. Now, by the time I, I, I got out, I went to the hospital and both my arms were in a cast. Both of them were in casts. Now, for a writer to have both your arms in casts is obviously paralyzing. And up until that point, I was just a writer. And I was just a writer who had escaped other dangerous situations, but unscathed. But now I was a writer who understood consequence. I understood what it meant to feel on your body personally. What it, what it meant to have a revolution. I understood what it meant to experience police brutality and sexual violence on your body. And I understood because I couldn't use my, my ten fingers to type like I usually did, that I had to use something else to convey my message. And so I realized that my body was now the, 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 my means of conveying a message because I couldn't write for three months because of the casts. And I also understood that I needed to reward myself for surviving. And so I promised myself that when my bones healed, I would dye my hair red, because red is a fierce color, and it says I'm here, and I survived. And I also promised myself tattoos on my arms, because on this arm I needed an operation because the bone broke inside. So I needed surgery, and it's got a titanium plate and five screws on it. And I'm very proud of this scar. I will never cover up the scar. But I wanted something, markings of my own on my body. So I got a tattoo on my right forearm of the Egyptian goddess Sekhmet. Now, I hope nobody is offended by cursing, because I curse a lot, and I'm about to. <laughs> so the Egyptian goddess Sekhmet is the goddess of retribution and sex, and I say yes to both. And Sekhmet, for me, represents someone who will first kick your head in and then fuck your brains out. 
And then on my right arm, I have Arabic calligraphy. And the calligraphy says Muhammad Mahmoud in honor of that street, which is now an icon of our revolution, and on which at least 40 people were killed and 300 injured. So I'm lucky to be alive. And also the Arabic word for freedom, Hurraya, because we were liberated on that street. So that explains the way I look. Now let's talk about my book and the revolution and what's happening in Egypt. When the Tunisians rose up against their dictator Ben Ali in 2010, they rose up against a political regime that oppressed everyone, men and women. You often hear that nobody's free in the Middle East and North Africa, and it's true. The regime oppresses everybody. The Tunisians began their revolution in December of 2010 and inspired many other countries, including my own Egypt. So you saw men and women on the street together, side by side, fighting this political system that oppresses men and women. But it became an increasingly pressing question for me. What happens when we, the women, go home? What happens when we look at the men that we marched with and fought with and fought alongside with and protested with? What happens when we go home? Are they our comrades? Are they also believers in our liberation? What is their position here? And many things happened along the way until I wrote this book to persuade me that while the state oppresses men and women, there's a, what I call a trifecta, a triangle of misogyny and patriarchy. And this trifecta oppresses women specifically. And the points of this triangle are the state, which oppresses men and women, the street, and the home. And together, the street, the, the state, the street, and the home oppress women. And this is where it became increasingly obvious to me that in order for our political revolution to succeed, we need a social and a sexual revolution. We in Egypt managed to get rid of the Mubarak in the presidential palace, but we need to overthrow the Mubarak on the street corner and the Mubarak in the home. The Mubarak on the street corner represents the social revolution that we need to have in tandem with the, so the sexual revolution against the Mubarak at home. And of all of these revolutions, the hardest and the most necessary is the revolution in the home, the sexual revolution, because the Mubarak in the palace and the Mubarak on the street corner all go home. And the, the things that, that drove me to this point and that have made me insistent on talking about the social and sexual revolution, specifically the sexual one, and to share my own experience of sexual violence and assault and survival, is what happened less than a month after Mubarak had to step down. Because in, on March 9th of 2011, he stepped down on February the 11th, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces in Egypt, the junta that took over Egypt until we had presidential elections, stormed Tahrir Square and emptied the square and took all the men and women into custody. This was the military now. And the military sexually violated at least 17 women in the guise of so-called virginity tests, this obsession with hymens, because they threatened to sue, to what they claim that they did this because they didn't want the women to accuse them of raping or sexually violating them while in detention, as if only a virgin can be raped. So when, when the first of these women began to speak out against this awful violation, nobody wanted to believe her. Everybody wanted to believe that the military was going to protect us. Everybody wanted to believe that because the military didn't open fire, they were on our side. And it was a big lie because the military admitted itself a few months later that they had indeed conducted these so-called virginity tests. And the military still in power in Egypt. We got rid of Hosni Mubarak, but we did not get rid of one of our main goals, which is military rule in Egypt, which has been in place since 1952. And we are, I believe, currently under a fascist dictator called Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who comes from the military. Now, this was back in 2011 when these women spoke out, first of all. So there was more anger directed towards these women who were exposing the sexual violation they were subjected to by the military than the actual sexual violation. And I, I saw that and I thought, we're going to have another revolution for sure. We're going to have a revolution to defend our brave women revolutionaries because this cannot happen during revolutionary times. But nothing happened. And when these women tried to sue the military, they lost their case. And then we saw many other instances of violence against women specifically, including what happened to me. Now, when I was um, beaten and had my arms broken and I was sexually assaulted on Mohammed Mahmoud Street, I discovered several months later that at least 12 other women were also sexually assaulted in almost the exact same way as I had. 
But none of them was able to speak. And none of them was able to speak out against uh, about what happened to them because sexual assault comes with a, with a big price tag, especially in a conservative country like Egypt. And I found out that 12 other women had been assaulted in almost the exact same way as I had because a feminist group in Egypt called Nazra for Feminist Studies asked me if I would sue the regime because none of the other women wanted to go public. And I, I said, yes, of course I will. And I gathered my x-rays and my doctor's reports and all kinds of things to prove a case for myself. And it was presented to the then prosecutor general who had been appointed by Mubarak before the revolution. And he just put my complaint into a drawer and it was never addressed and it was never taken to court. And I have never ever uh, had my case answered or received any kind of justice. As many people in Egypt, many of us are waiting for justice. Hence, Sekhmet, retribution and justice. And then many of you might be familiar with the image of the woman who was dragged through Tahrir Square, who was, uh, six soldiers were stomping on her chest. Unfortunately, we don't know her name. And the reason that we don't know her name is because her family has silenced her from speaking. I don't know if it's because they're ashamed of what happened to her or what, but we don't even know who she is. She is one of our many anonymous women revolutionary heroes, women who deserve to have statues built in their honor and name, but we don't even know her name. So all of this kept building up, kept building up. And then we began to hear about these gangs that would go specifically with the target of sexually assaulting women in protests. And I thought, you know, wh what is that? Where is that coming from? And I realized it was coming from this Mubarak on the street corner. Because if we had a Mubarak in the presidential palace that we overthrew, there was a Mubarak on the street corner. And there was a Mubarak at home. And those three Mubaraks formed that trifecta that we need to overthrow for the complete revolution to happen. Because having just a political revolution, where the women and men went outside by side, does not address the Mubarak on the street corner or the Mubarak in the bedroom. And I will get to the Mubarak in the bedroom soon. So when we began to see these men who would go out in gangs and assault women in protests, you know, many of us started wondering, you know, what is going on? These are women going out in the revolution, taking part. And obviously what was going on was women going out and claiming public space. And the thing about men, and this isn't just about men in the Middle East and North Africa now, this is men around the world, because I will get to it. The sense of entitlement to public space is global. Levels of sexual violence around the world are horrific, not just in the Middle East and North Africa. What the Middle East and North Africa lacks is legal recourse. This is why I could not sue the regime for what it did to me, because it was the police. It was the police that broke my arms and it was the police that, that sexually assaulted me. So you had men who were reacting to the sight of women going out to reclaim public space. And those men I called the Mubarak on the street corner. Something inside them did not like the idea of women claiming public space. And so that's the Mubarak that we need to overthrow as part of the social revolution. What about the revolution at home now? This is the sexual revolution. That's probably the hardest of all the revolutions. And that revolution, I say, it's a, is a revolution of consent and agency. Because when I talk about the sexual revolution especially, and, why, and the reason that it's in the subtitle of my book, when I'm asked to address what does, a, what does the sexual revolution mean, and I, I gave a, an interview about it recently in Arabic to France 24, the French satellite channel in Arabic, and I had a mini revolution happened on social media. The first time I came here, I, I talked about social media and how young people especially are using social media to fight back against the regime. And many of those same young people who had found their voice on Facebook and Twitter were on the street during our various revolutions and uprisings. But when I went on this satellite channel and talked about the sexual revolution and talked about this revolution of consent and agency, I basically said that what the sexual revolution is, is women saying, that I own my body, my body is mine, and I can do with my body what I like. And that extends to everything. And when I talk about the sexual revolution, and when I talk about overthrowing the Mubarak at home, what it means is a woman saying, I deserve consent and agency every step of the way. And so that spreads to things like violations of the, the rights of the girl child in the form of female genital mutilation. That spreads to, that includes things like marital rape, because a woman's sexual agency is very important. It extends to things like rape laws that allow a rapist to escape conviction if he agrees to marry his victim, etc., etc. But most importantly for me, it also extends to sexual agency for a woman. And so I was on television in Arabic saying that as an adult, I have the right to have sex with whomever and whenever 
obviously with their consent. And inside marriage and outside of marriage, same sex or heterosexual, whenever I choose, and obviously if you are asexual, you don't have to have sex at all. So to say that, to say all of those things under the sexual revolution is in and of itself revolutionary. And that's why the subtitle of my book is Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. And that's why that is the hardest revolution. Because when you talk about sexual agency for a woman, you're talking about the need to fight crimes against the girl child like female genital mutilation. You're talking about the need to fight things like marital rape. You're talking about um, things like sex education in school. You're talking about things that basically give women agency in things that many men take for granted. So this idea of agency and consent. And that idea of agency and consent goes out onto the street as well and protects women from things like sexual assault and the sexual violence that they were experiencing in, in the various protests. Now, when I connect what is happening to the Middle East and North Africa, I, I talk about a spectrum of misogyny and patriarchy because I don't want people to think that I've written this book just to say, oh, the Middle East and North Africa is the worst part of the world for, for girls and women, and that's the only part of the world that needs a sexual revolution. Because what I'm talking about is that I'm talking about global feminism. I'm talking about, for example, China, where I was 20 years ago. I went to the women's conference in China, the United Nations Conference for Women, that was in Beijing 20 years ago, where women were able to get the most advanced and progressive reproductive rights platform ever. And it was so progressive and they have, it's been attacked so often that the United Nations has never had a conference like it again because it used to have this conference for women every 10 years because of serious concerns about many of those rights that were guaranteed to women being eroded. And they were being eroded by many people. And they included the Vatican, they included Muslim clerics, and they included Christian conservatives in this country. And Muslims, Christians, and along with the Vatican, formed this unholy alliance. And they have been in this unholy alliance ever since, trying to destroy the reproductive rights, the incredibly progressive reproductive rights platform that we managed to, to secure in Beijing 20 years ago. And when it, so when I talk about China and I connect it to what's happening with, with, with my book, I am thrilled to hear that there is a feminist movement that I did not know about when I was in China 20 years ago. Some of you might know that in the run-up to International Women's Day this year, International Women's Day is March 8th, several Chinese feminist activists were arrested and five of them were detained for quite a while and they became known as the Feminist Five. So I connect what I'm doing with the Feminist Five in China because I believe that this is a global feminist moment. I also feel solidarity with my sisters, my feminist sisters in India, where many of you might have heard of the Delhi gang rape almost three years ago now. What many of you probably did not hear about is, is the huge protests against sexual violence that erupted in India after that, that awful assault on that woman. And many of us, including myself, did not know of the very, very strong feminist movement in India that for a long time had fought against something called Eve teasing, which was a form of street sexual harassment that obviously the most serious and dire consequence of is awful and brutal sexual violence. So there, there is a feminist moment in India that I connect and find solidarity with. I also found solidarity this year with feminists in Afghanistan, who after a young woman called Farhunda was lynched and murdered, and her lynching and murder was actually filmed by people who were there using on their mobile phones. During the funeral, the women insisted on the right to bury Farhunda. Now, according to conservative Muslim tradition, Women can only join the funeral procession up to a certain part and then they have to go home and the men, take, the men bury the corpse. But the women in Afghanistan insisted that they would bury Farhunda. That's a feminist moment. That's a global feminist moment. And something very similar happened in Turkey at the end of last year when a young woman was raped and brutally murdered. And women again went to her funeral and insisted that they would bury her and they would not allow, as they said, we would not allow another man to touch her. That was a feminist, a global feminist moment. And I also connect this global feminist struggle to the Black Lives Matter movement here in the United States. Some of you might know, many of you might not, that the Black Lives Matter movement, which was launched several years ago, was actually launched by three queer black women. And they are my sisters in this feminist struggle because their struggle isn't just against race and sexism, but their struggle is also against homophobia. And so when the, the protests against the police killing, not the police killing, the killing of Trayvon Martin broke out, 
Black Lives Matter was there. When the, when the protest against the police killing of Michael Brown, Black Lives Matter was there. And you've seen many protests over the past year or so under the banner, hashtag Black, black Lives Matter. And, and that movement was launched by three queer black women. And I connect all of those movements with what we're doing in the Middle East and North Africa as global feminist moments. And when I look at that, as a woman who is Egyptian and Muslim and feminist, I recognize that the feminist revolution especially, especially when I'm now talking about overthrowing the Mubarak in the bedroom, the hardest of the revolutions, the revolution for women of color, which is what I identify with, is multi-layered or intersectional, as we often say. And I connect it to the global struggle so that, again, you don't think that this misogyny and patriarchy that we're fighting is just in the Middle East and North Africa, so that we understand that there's a struggle against misogyny and patriarchy here. So, for example, in Egypt, I fight against the Muslim Brotherhood, I fight against the military regime, and here I fight against what I call the Christian Brotherhood, because there is a Christian coalition in this country that has been readily and steadily eroding women's reproductive rights. They belong to that unholy alliance that I mentioned earlier that has been trying to destroy what is called the Beijing platform of, on reproductive rights. And that Christian coalition here I call the Christian Brotherhood, as I call the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And I connect them to ultra-Orthodox Jews who are also obsessed with women's bodies and women's sexuality because I was a correspondent for Reuters news agency in Jerusalem for about 13 months. And this, what I call the unholy alliance, to all of them my message is simple. I say to all of these religious conservatives who are determined to control women's sex lives especially, stay out of my vagina unless I want you in there. Now, it's important to connect all of these moments together and to recognize what women are fighting for because it, we need a global alliance and we need global solidarity. I wrote my book about my part of the world because that's where I'm from and I would resent it if someone from outside the region wrote about this because this is my region and it, we have to hear the local voices from each region. That's why I refer to the, the women in China known as the Feminist Five, and I refer to the feminists in, in Turkey and Afghanistan and India, and here the feminists of the Black Lives Matter movement especially. And here in the United States, when we have to talk about sexual violence, and we have to talk about feminism, and we have to talk about women's rights, especially because we have a very important election coming up next year. And one of the things that has been coming up again and again that I like to connect to my work is I remind people that there is a spectrum of misogyny, that especially as feminists, <clears throat> excuse me, I need water. Does anybody have water? Sorry, I've been speaking like almost every day, so my voice is um, on the verge. <clears throat> especially as a feminist in the United States with the, with the elections coming up, I'm very concerned about reproductive rights. I'm very concerned about what the Christian Brotherhood wants to do to women's reproductive rights, especially as someone who spent some time, as I mentioned in my book, teaching in Oklahoma, and understanding how they use a mix of religion and politics in the same way that the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamists in the Middle East do. That's why I call all of these religious groups they're, they're each other's allies, and I am fighting against any group that tries to get rid of women's sexual and reproductive rights. Thank you very much. And uses religion as an excuse. Thank you. <laughs> yes, stop fighting our reproductive rights. Um, no, so here in the United States, I mean, feminism is very much a thing of today. Not just the feminists of the Black Lives Matter movement, who I, I told you inspire me on many levels, because they fight as queer women, they fight as black women, and they fight an internal and external misogyny, as well as racism. But when we talk about reproductive rights, and, and the real threat to reproductive rights, we also have to talk about sexual violence against women in this country. There, there was an awful study that came out about sexual violence on university campuses and it was estimated that at least 20 percent of women students on campuses are sexually assaulted this is a horrific statistic i mean sexual violence anywhere is horrific but we're talking about women on university campuses and these are often sexual violence or sexual um, various forms of sexual violence that are rarely reported rarely taken seriously and often because these are women who are young and unequipped with, with the language of sexual violence and how to fight sexual violence, though, those sexual attacks often go unreported, and that is a crime, obviously. So that's 20% 
of young American women on university campuses are sexually assaulted. And that has to end. So when I talk about this Mubarak in the bedroom that we have to fight, when I talk about the Mubarak on the street corner, I like to take it global so that we never get this, this sense of cultural superiority, as my student in Oklahoma almost, almost did. Because when you talk about, when I bring my experience from the Middle East and North Africa, I, I can talk about it so boldly and openly because it's my culture. It's difficult, but I can talk about it because it's my people. But I have to connect it to what's happening here so that it doesn't become this alien thing that happens over there. We have to talk about what's happening over here. And levels of sexual violence around the world against women are horrific. And we have to talk about them. And we have to enable young women and young men who experience sexual violence, but it's mostly young women. We have to give them the strength and we have to give them the solidarity to be able to face what happened to them and to help them take it to court if they want, and if not, to give them the kind of therapy and care that they need. We cannot continue to allow sexual violence, whether on street camp or on university campuses or domestic violence or anywhere for that matter, to go unnoticed and unreported. When I go, depending on which country I go to, I like to connect what's happening there with, with their women's rights movement to what's happening where I am so that it can be a global movement. So a few weeks ago, for example, I was launching my book in Denmark and Norway which are probably the most progressive countries when it comes to women's rights, because they've had quotas for a very long time that have ensured that they've had many prime ministers. So progressive is a country like Norway and Denmark, for example, that some, especially Norway, where they've had many women prime ministers, that sometimes when a man is running for politics, boys ask their mothers, mummy, is it possible for a man to run for office? <laughs> so it's that progressive. But, you know, but even in Scandinavia, where they've had years of quotas to ensure some form of political parity. There isn't complete 50%, 50% political parity. There isn't even um, job equality. There isn't that they have not managed to erase domestic and sexual violence. And so I often get up on podiums like this and ask, what is wrong with men? What is going on with men around the world that we have not even in the most progressive countries that have ensured the most progressive social record they still haven't been able to get rid of things like street sexual harassment, sexual violence, and domestic violence. So when I talk about misogyny and I talk about patriarchy, I like to draw a line, a spectrum, and remind people that every country has a position on that spectrum. Because I, I talk very openly about the problems women face in my part of the world, because it's my part of the world. But the last thing I want you to do is say, oh my God, it's so bad over there, everything is great over here, and thank God I'm not a woman over there. Because we have problems here. And I speak now as an Egyptian American. And I mentioned this 20% of university students are sexually assaulted on campus as an example of how concerning it is for me as an American that women are sexually violated and it often goes unreported. It concerns me deeply the high levels of domestic violence and sexual violence generally in this country. And we have, we're far, far away from this country. And I vote. We're far away from having political parity. We haven't even had a woman president yet. So when we talk about this, this spectrum of misogyny, it's really important to me that you don't think that I'm coming over here to just say it's so bad in the Middle East and North Africa. Everything is great over here because it's not. We, we still have a long way to go in this country. We've managed to achieve rights thank, thanks to feminist movements of various times, especially second wave feminism. And we have much younger variations of it now. But it's very important for me that you don't buy my book and think, oh, we're so much better off here. Because there are many things that we need to fix in this country as well. And I'm going to read you um, a section from my book now to kind of turn things upside down a bit from my part of the world. I'm not sure if we're going to have a QA. and a Are we having a QA? and a OK, so I'm going to wrap up here now, because I, I don't want to, I could talk for hours and hours, but I won't. But I, I want to read you this section here, because having connected this, this global women's struggle for equality and against sexual violence, I also want to remind people that the way things are in my part of the world, in the Middle East and North Africa, it wasn't always like this. I think that a lot of the problems that we have, especially when it comes to women's rights, and I drew that triangle for you, is because of dictatorships. Dictatorships that are supported by the US administration, by the European Union, by many Western governments that would never tolerate a dictatorship like that. So ask yourself, why does the US administration continue to sell weapons and give aid to my fascist dictator? 
Why does the US administration and the European Union continue to sell weapons to all these dictators in the region that we have shown the world we are willing to rise up against? Because in the past, people would ask us, well, rise up and we will, we will pay attention. We rose up, but we rose up with our hands tied behind our backs. And we rose up against regimes that we know are funded and are supported by various Western powers. And they give them weapons which they use against us. But our part, my part of the world wasn't always like that. There was a time in my part of the world where we had much more openness when it came to the arts, when it came to, to sex, when it came to women's rights. And one of, one of the things that I try to do in my book is to remind people that I'm fight, what I'm fighting for now is not inspired by Western feminism, even though I'm a great admirer of Western feminism, and I'm very honored and proud to say that I'm, I'm getting an award this year from the Women's Media Center, which was set up by Gloria Steinem, Robin Morgan, and Jane Fonda. Robin Morgan and Gloria Steinem especially are icons of second wave feminism in this country. And these women are personal heroes of mine, and I'm very humbled to call them personal friends as well. And I admire them greatly, but we have an indigenous feminist movement in my part of the world. I have not had to refer to the West as an example of feminism. And we also have a long history that many of us have forgotten and people outside the region have no idea about because we ourselves have forgotten. I mention in, in my book about the, the birth of the modern feminist movement in the Middle East and North Africa um, as around the 1920s when an Egyptian woman named Hoda Sharawi removed her face veil and said this is a thing of the past. Now sadly we're still fighting over the face veil and whether it's a requirement or not and I believe it's not. But this woman launched a revolution at the time in the 1920s when the suffragists were chaining themselves to the fences at Buckingham Palace and demanding political rights in the UK. Now there's a film that's out that I'm very eager to see called Suffragette that will remind us of that time. At that time in Egypt Women were rising up, but you know who was paying this, we want stability here, but we don't want it here. And this is why I complain about Western powers and how they sell weapons to our dictators and allow dictators to do things back in the 1920s. And this is why colonization and imperialism in my part of the world is especially problematic. The British High Commissioner in Egypt, he was basically the kind of the, the, the crown's representative, the, the man who ruled Egypt under colonization, was a man called Lord Cromer. Lord Cromer was against women's political rights in the UK. So those suffragists who were chaining themselves to the fences of Buckingham Palace in the early years of the, of the 20th century, he was against their political rights. But in Egypt, he was advocating for women's rights. And, and that's the hypocrisy that I'm talking about. And we had people indigenous to the region who were fighting for women's rights. Long, long ago, during the Islamic empire, we had women, we lost it in the middle. But I mentioned the modern feminist movement in my part of the world so that no one thinks I'm, in, I'm exporting anything. We have an indigenous women's rights movement. In the sixth to the, no, seventh to the 12th century, we also had these amazing women poets whose work I discovered through a great book called Classical Poems by Arab Women, a Bilingual Anthology. And it was compiled and translated by Abdullah al udhairi I'm going to finish my presentation now with some readings from these poems because I, I talked about the sexual revolution, which is the revolution against the Mubarak in the home, which I connect to the sexual revolution that happened in this country when you had second wave feminists like Robin Morgan and Gloria Steinem who went out on the streets and protested for women's reproductive rights, our, um, the, the highlight of our kind of um, culture and, and history came during the Umayyad, Abbasid and Andalusian times, the Islamic empire, when it, when was, it was at its height. And I discovered these amazing female poets who talked boldly and talked very, very openly about sex in a way that we've lost. So again, I don't have to resort to the West to import anything, especially when it comes to this Mubarak at home and the sexual revolution, because I have it in my own heritage. So I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna share with you some of the poetry that I discovered through this book and then open it up to Q&A. And I'll read a bit from my book. Um, that I, I start with um, the Syrian poet Nizar Kabbani. Some of you might know Nizar Kabbani, who was one of the greats of Arab poetry. And he, in the 1960s, was writing openly about sex in a way that no woman had dared in a very long time. And he was advocating for women's sexual liberation. But I ask in my book, where is our female Kabbani? She existed once. One book introduced me to the great female poets of desire in Arabic, classical poems by Arab women, a bilingual anthology. 
Mursi Farhi, writing for the website Poetry Magazines, praised classical poems as follows, and I highly recommend you buy this anthology. I cannot think of a collection that exclusively features women who boldly refuse to be voiceless in a world where the male hegemonic psychosis, in various rabid modes, seeks to enslave and usurp them. This is a collection wherein women declare freely and proudly their equality with men. This is between the, the, the years, the 7th century to the 12th century. It not only includes poetry from the Jahileya, so it actually goes before that. So the Jahileya is the period before Islam, so it's pre-Islamic Arabia. It not only includes poetry from the Jahileya period, the period before the advent of Islam, which Muslim scholars and historians invariably and wrongly dismiss as a period of chaos and ignorance and therefore of no historical significance, but also from the seminal periods which established Islam as a vibrant major religion, the Umayyad, Abbasid and Andalusian periods. End of quote. The collection's range of female poets from radically different eras is extraordinary, as is how fearlessly they speak about their desires. Again, this is about the sexual revolution. From the Umayyad Caliphate, which would be from the year, the year 603 to 750, there is Dana bin Tamashal as she reprimands her husband. Lay off, you can't turn me on with a cuddle, a kiss or scent. Only a thrust rocks out my strains until the ring on my toe falls on my sleeve. And Bint al-Hubbab boasting of her adultery. Why are you raving mad, husband, just because I love another man? Go on, whip me. Every scar on my body will show the pain I cause you. From the Abbasid period, 750 to 1258, here is Safiya al-Baghdadiya. I am the wonder of the world, the ravisher of hearts and minds. Once you've seen my stunning looks, you're a fallen man. And finally, Atamad al-Rumaykiya from the 11th century, who implores her lover with no compunction. I urge you to come faster than the wind, to mount my breast and firmly dig and plow my body and don't let go until you flushed me thrice. That's what I call a booty call. <laughs> So that's my presentation, and I won't say any more until I get your questions. There's a lot more I could say, but I would love to hear your questions. Thank you. What are we going to do? We're going to have to share a microphone. Sure. All right. Well, thank you, Mona. Thank you. Um, first question. You mentioned the ineffectiveness of having political change without cultural change and changing mindsets. How can these cultural changes occur or be encouraged? The cultural changes are already happening. I mean, there are many things that I mention in the book and then I often bring up during Q&As, otherwise I could just talk forever. There are many activists around the region who are fighting that Mubarak on the street corner and the Mubarak in the bedroom. For example, I mention activists in Morocco who are fighting against the law that criminalizes sex outside of marriage. So they're fighting to basically enable anyone who wants to have sex in a consensual relationship, obviously, to have sex without it being criminalized. And there's um, a Moroccan feminist called Khadija Riyadi who was fighting for this and fighting to change the Moroccan penal code so that she can bring about the sexual revolution and the cultural revolution that I mentioned briefly in, that I mentioned briefly in, in my introduction. There are activists in Jordan, for example, that I quote in my book, who are fighting against um, very unfair laws that allow a rapist to marry his victim, which sounds horrific. But according to the legal system of many of the countries there, a rapist has the, the, the ability to escape conviction if he agrees to marry his victim. And this is why I talk about the sexual revolution and women's sexual agency and consent, because uh, the kind of law that allows a rapist to marry his victim and therefore escape conviction is the kind of law that holds virginity, virginity up as some kind of god and that if a woman is raped and is no longer a virgin is considered damaged goods. And so what these, what these activists are trying to fight is this very idea. And because this, what this law does is they want to contain that. So he's raped a virgin. And so instead of having no one wanting to marry her anymore, her family agrees that she can marry her rapist, which is something that I can't even begin to imagine. This is unimaginable. So I, meant, I went and met activists who were fighting this fighting to change the legal system, and they have allies among women who are in the Jordanian parliament. 
Now, one thing that happened in Jordan after the revolutions and uprising began, uprisings began is that Jordan is a monarchy and a major US ally, by the way. Jordan is a monarchy that did not undergo revolutions and uprisings as we did, just as Morocco. But what both of those countries did, what the kings in both of those countries did was they looked at the countries that were having uprisings, such as my own Egypt, and thought, OK, how can we stem the tide? And so what they ended up doing was um, making some cosmetic changes and in Jordan's example, or Jordan's case, for example, allowing a quota for women in the Jordanian parliament. And what that quota has, has done is it, it's allowed the highest representation for women in the Jordanian parliament. And one of the things that those women are doing is to fight that law that allows a rapist to marry his victim. Because I cannot imagine anything that is more horrific. So those women are fighting in parliament, and those activists are fighting with them. And that political fight and that activist fight together are going to create these cultural changes that I'm talking about. In Morocco, I also already mentioned someone like um, Khadija Riyadi. In Libya, in, um, I, mentioned, I quote several activists from Libya. In Saudi Arabia, where you've had women fighting against the ban to drive and getting arrested for it every year, even in Saudi Arabia, which is probably one of the hardest countries and one of the, fr one of the best friends of the United States. Because in the region, I would probably say Saudi Arabia and Egypt are probably America's best friends. And we, as Americans, and I speak as an American now, we are great friends to the Saudi royal family, the Saudi regime, knowing that they practice what I call gender apartheid. Many of you will remember South Africa's apartheid, which was discrimination based on racial lines. Saudi Arabia practices gender apartheid, in which women are basically infantilized all of their lives. And they have to abide by the rules of, and, and follow a guardian, a male guardian. And they are one of our best friends. Again, I speak as an American. So I have examples of all these women who are engaged in this cultural revolution. And what they're doing is they are the vanguard, because that's what every revolution is. People often ask me, are they the majority? I'm not concerned about the majority. I think I said last time I was here, and I often say it, the majority never, ever stages a revolution. The revolution is always by a committed and very angry minority, which is why I'm a big fan of angry people, especially angry women. And there's plenty of us in the Middle East and North Africa, believe me. Um, in fact, you were just speaking about Saudi Arabia, and there's a more of a, a statement, but perhaps you could comment on it, uh, on somebody who'd lived in Saudi. Mm -hmm. um, and says, the common treatment of women in the Arab world seems to be consistent with an ownership uh, type of relationship. Uh, and is blamed, is, you know, religion is used as an excuse. Mm -hmm. um, how, what would you say to that? Right. Well, one of the things that I, I highlight in my book is what I call a toxic mix of religion and culture. And when I talk about that, I'm, I, I want to be very clear that it's, when I talk about religion, it's Islam and Christianity. Because we, we have Muslims and Christians in the Middle East and North Africa. And two examples of, of how that toxic mix play out that I give in my book are Saudi Arabia and Lebanon. So in Saudi Arabia, I lived in Saudi Arabia for six years and I would go back for another 12 years because my parents continued to teach medicine there. So I have a very long experience with Saudi Arabia and I'm very familiar with that toxic mix of religion and culture, especially the guardianship system that I mentioned. And um, in Saudi Arabia, for example, when it comes to domestic violence, they finally had a domestic violence law that went into effect. But what that domestic violence law ends up doing is keeping a woman at the mercy of her guardian, because everyone has a guardian, and, and women are treated infantilized for all their lives, because at first your guardian is your father, and then your guardian is your husband. So in order to report domestic violence, I mean, it's a good thing they have a domestic violence law. That is a good step in the right direction. Every country needs a law against domestic violence. But you have to enforce that law. So how, as a woman in Saudi Arabia who cannot drive, and if you don't have a driver, because not everyone can afford a driver in Saudi Arabia. Not everybody, believe it or not, is rich in Saudi Arabia. How can you get to the police to report, to use this very, very essential law now? You can't. And so you, you're, you're totally dependent on your guardian to take you to the police to report domestic violence. What if it's your guardian who's abusing you? How then do you ask your guardian to take you to the police to report him for domestic violence? So that's one of the, the cases that I mentioned in Saudi. But this toxic mix of religion and culture, when I, I brought Lebanon into it, because I wanted, I wanted to be very clear, just as I mentioned the Christian coalition, or what I call the Christian Brotherhood in this country, to make it very clear about how religion is used against women globally, and, it, and it's not just Islam. And I speak as a Muslim, and I'm very familiar with this notion that it's just Islam that discriminates against women. And I speak as a, as a Muslim and a feminist who 
fights tirelessly against any religion fighting women's rights, especially my own, Islam. So I brought Lebanon in, into the chapter on domestic violence in Egypt, or the home, basically, where the Mubarak at home lives. Because it's very important to remember a country like Lebanon, which has Muslims and Christians. And I mentioned what happened in Lebanon when uh, women's rights activists there tried to pass their own anti-domestic violence law. Now, Lebanon has its own you know, political upheavals, and they hadn't had a parliament in a long time. But finally, when politicians looked at this draft law, the church and the mosque intervened because there was language in the law that would have criminalized marital rape. Now, marital rape should be a crime everywhere, but I want to remind you that marital rape only became a crime in this country in the 1980s. So it's important to remember that, that spectrum of misogyny that I'm talking about. These are not problems just specific to my part of the world. These are global problems, that question of, you know, what is wrong with men? This is globally, unless the law and politics and the, and, and the culture, this trifecta of Mubarak's, unless we rise up against all of them, women around the world are subject to all of these Mubarak's. So this domestic violence law, which, as I said, mar or marital rape in, in the US was only criminalized in the 1980s. In Lebanon, it was going to be part of this anti-domestic violence law bill, but the church and the mosque intervened. And not only did they remove the language from that anti-domestic violence bill, uh, anti-domestic violence bill, yes, from Parliament, uh, against marital rape. They included language that gave a man the right to sex on demand from his wife. Yeah. For Muslim and Christian men in Lebanon. So this isn't just about Islam. This is about men. This is about men using an entitlement and a sense of, I own a woman's body everywhere. Because when, we, uh, when we're talking about sexual violence in this country, or sexual violence in Turkey, or sexual violence anywhere, what we're fighting is the idea that men are entitled to women's bodies. So I, I connect those and, and, and say this toxic mix of religion and culture has to be fought everywhere, in this country, in Israel, where I mentioned I spent some time as a correspondent, in Europe, wherever, because we all have a place on that spectrum of misogyny, and we have to move ahead on that place. That then takes us to the next question quite well, actually. Would you then not say that the issue is more a separation of church and state, separation of mosque and state, rather than a sexual revolution per se? Well, I mean, I would say that this country believes it has separated church and state. I would say that Europe believes it has separated church and state. I would say that Scandinavia believes it has separated church and state. But there's still domestic violence against women. There's still sexual violence against women. I mentioned how in the Scandinavian countries, for example, which have probably progressed the most along that spectrum, the Scandinavian countries are very secular. I just came back from Denmark and Norway. But domestic and sexual violence is still very much a reality. So without, that, without legal protection, without political rights for women, without that cultural awareness everywhere, not just in my part of the world, violence against women, including sexual violence, remains a reality. So I, I identify as a secular feminist. I don't identify as a Muslim feminist. But I do mention in my book many Muslim feminists, and I have as allies Catholic feminists and Jewish feminists. And I mention those especially because I, I have a, a friend of mine who is a reconstructionist rabbi who is also a feminist. And her work tries to mitigate against orthodoxy in the Jewish religion because a lot of what orthodox women experience is very similar to what Catholic and Muslim women experience in that men are the only ones ordained. There are no Catholic women priests. It's a big struggle. Many of you might know. We don't have women imams in, in Islam. And, and so I connect all of those in, in my book. But the question was about the separation of religion and state, right? But for those, for those who want to stay in, in the religion and state, I mean, this, this question could just go everywhere. For those who want to and identify as Muslim feminists, I am their ally as well. Because that Jewish rabbi and um, groups like Catholics for Free Choice and others that advocate for the rights of women who choose to remain in a religion, they are necessary. Because in some places, religion and, and state have not been separated. So I mentioned, for example, a group that I belong to, a movement that I belong to, called Musawa, which is the Arabic word for equality. And this is a movement for equality and justice for Muslim women, or, or in, in the Muslim family. And it was launched in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, in 2009. And that movement is worldwide. 
and it is big enough to have secular feminists such as myself and women who identify as Muslim feminists. And one of them that I mention in my book is a friend and uh, uh, someone whose work has inspired me for years and years, uh, an African-American scholar of Islam called Amina Wadud. Now, Amina identifies as a Muslim feminist, and she's written several great books, and, and one of the best for me that I think represents her views as a Muslim feminist is called, um, uh, what is it? Something gender jihad, uh, Islam and gender jihad. And so she, called, she, she considers what she's engaged in a form of jihad. Now, many people think of the word jihad as something that is violent and is associated with you know, weapons and blowing people up and suicide bombing. But she's using this word jihad in, it, in its original meaning, which is struggle. And so she's talking about the struggle for gender rights. And Amina Wadud is one of, my, one of my icons, one of my personal heroes. And Musawa is big enough to, to, to have us both. And we, we recognize that both secular feminists and Muslim feminists are necessary in the struggle because there will be people who do not believe in a separation of church and state or mosque and state. How am I then supposed to bring them into this? How am I supposed to convince them? that domestic violence is wrong, that sexual violence is wrong, that this is not how you can use Islam. And that's why I mentioned that my allies are Jewish women rabbis from the reconstructionist and reform movements or, or, or strains of Judaism, and also people like Francis Kisling, who was a co-founder, some of you might know, of Catholics for Free Choice. So I find these allies, because, and they're necessary, because there are some people whose feminism will not take them out of their religious background. And, and having the feminists of these religious backgrounds makes it possible for them to be involved in the struggle. I'm, I separated the, the religion from my feminism many years ago, but in order to have my sisters who do not want to have that separation, I need to make these alliances. So in this country, we, we like to say we have a separation of state, but the reason I bring up the Christian, the Christian Brotherhood is clearly that many, many people are not convinced in this separation between uh, religion and, and politics. And we see it, especially in the run-up to elections. But we need to be inspired by people like Reconstructionist women rabbis and Reformist women rabbis and the women in the Catholic uh, movement to ordain women. And Amina Wadud, in 2005, led us in a Friday prayer as her attempt to, to be ordained, if you like, even though we don't have uh, a priesthood in Islam. We do have clerics who lead prayers. And she led us in a Friday prayer in 2005, which was revolutionary because she took for her, herself the right to lead a Friday prayer. And that Friday prayer had 50 men and 50 women in New York. And to this day, people still talk about it. And this year was the 10th anniversary of that prayer. So I connect to all of these feminists who are fighting within a religious structure. And I connect with them as a secular feminist, and I find others, because we're all allies, because we need to use whatever weapons we can find to fight against anyone who does not believe in women's equality. So you're identifying yourself as a secular mm -hmm. feminist, mm -hmm. but there was a time when you did identify yourself as a Muslim yes. feminist, and yes. in fact, you wore hijab. You, That's right. And I think your words were, you made the choice to wear hijab at the yes. age of 16. Yes. Isn't it the issue, though, that, and there's a lot of this discussion that goes on in the Middle East about women choosing to wear hijab. Doesn't mm -hmm. that choice, however, come from, uh, in, comes influenced by cultural norms? And how did you shake that? How did you right. get from there to where you are here, right. where I'm guessing a few people were offended? But in this. <laughs> I think it must have been, I think it's all my talk about the Christian Brotherhood. <laughs> So I'm guessing that whoever's left is not offended by my talk about the Christian Brotherhood. It's really, look, I lived, so I'm from Egypt. I grew up in Cairo. I grew up in London. I was a correspondent in Cairo and Jerusalem. And I lived in this country for 13 years. So I'm very familiar with the Jewish Brotherhood, the Christian Brotherhood, and the Muslim Brotherhood. And it's really important to make those connections because if we just stick to pointing fingers at the Brotherhood of the other people, nothing is going to be achieved. This is, a, when we talk about, when I talk about feminism, I talk about a global movement for the equality and rights of women around the world, not just in my part of the world, but for those who insist on wanting to point to my part of the world and say, it's so bad for women, and then forget that how many abortion clinics have been shut down in this state? What has happened to women's reproductive rights in Texas? What happened to Wendy Davis when she wanted to run? So I insist on coming to Texas and talking about the Christian Brotherhood because the Christian Brotherhood is very much alive and kicking in Texas. And I say that as an American. 
And I say that as the Egyptian who in Egypt talks about the Muslim Brotherhood, because I fight against the Muslim Brotherhood and the Christian Brotherhood and the Jewish Brotherhood. Because if any brotherhood is going to fight against women's rights, you've got to believe I'm going to be on the front lines and fight right back. So. I didn't answer your question, though. No. So, um, fighting the various brotherhoods, fighting against anyone who wants to erode women's rights, the veil, obviously, is probably the most explosive of those. And the veil is very easy to see as a specifically Muslim problem because, you know, we see Muslim women wearing a headscarf. But I think that it's very easy to forget that ultra-Orthodox Jewish women wear wigs because that's a form of veiling. It's very easy to forget that Catholic nuns to this day also veil. And it's very easy to forget that up until the 1950s and possibly 60s in many churches in this country, you could not worship unless you were wearing a hat. So again, this connection, my insistence that all religions are patriarchal, my insistence that all religions, unless we fight them and fight for our rights as women in them, are patriarchal, it becomes just throwing stones at each other and nothing is achieved. So I'm in alliance with any woman who wants to fight for the rights of any woman around the world. I'm not in alliance, however, with someone who wants to throw stones at my people. So the veil, now I wore a headscarf for nine years. I chose to, to wear it and I chose to take it off. So I, I understand this idea of choice, but I also understand that it was much easier to choose to wear it than it was to choose to take it off. So my question in the book is why was it easier to wear it than it was to take it off. And I discuss that, I, I devote a whole chapter to this in my book because it's what I call modesty culture. Now, that section that I read about being in Oklahoma comes from purity culture. We're all familiar in this room, I'm sure, with purity culture, especially here in the South, and what I call the Christian coalition has done to women's reproductive rights. So I connect that, I, I connect modesty culture to purity culture as this idea that women have to be treated in a certain way and often religion is used as the excuse, whether it's access to contraception or abortion or whether it's to determine what of a woman's body I can and can't see. So I used to believe that wearing a headscarf was a feminist choice. And then for many reasons, which I detail in my book, and so I urge you to buy my book, so I'm not gonna give it all away. But for reasons that I detail in my book, I stopped believing it was a feminist choice. And I found several Muslim women scholars who wrote about that, and Noel Saadabi was one of them, and another is the Moroccan sociologist, Fatima Mernisi, and, many, and the Egyptian-American scholar of divinity. She's actually the chair of the Harvard School of Divinity, an Egyptian-American scholar called Leila Ahmed. And they all made it very clear to me that veiling is something that predates Islam. Veiling was, a, was there in Mesopotamia, it was in pre-Islamic Arabia, and exists in many cultures. And as I said, ultra-Orthodox Jewish women who wear wigs and having to wear a hat or some kind of scarf to go to church until very recently, including in this country. So this idea of choice, I've always wrestled with it. You know, how much is this about choice and how much is this about pressure? And how, much is, and, and how free are we really to choose under those circumstances? So, and, and, and I have personal experience with this because I wrestled with my headscarf for eight years. So I wore it as a total of nine years, but I very quickly realized I didn't want to wear a headscarf anymore, but it took me eight years to take it off. Why? I keep asking why, why, why? So I'm now, I'm, I'm often asked, like I spoke at the University of um, Eastern Michigan a few days ago, EMU, and there were many young American Muslim students there in, in their headscarves, and they asked me many questions about why don't I think the headscarf is a feminist choice? Why do I oppose their choice? I was like, listen, you have the right to dress in the way that you want, but I no longer believe that the veil is something that is feminist. And I don't for the same reason that I reject modesty culture and purity culture, because neither of them are feminist, because they're both cultures that impose restrictions and a moral code specifically on girls and women. And when something is, is imposed on girls and women, that is not feminist. And so while I believe in a woman's right to choose, I do not call it a feminist choice. And, and so that in my book, I take a very firm position against all forms of veiling in any religious group, obviously, but I'm talking about mine as a Muslim. And I speak as someone whose mother wears a, a hijab and sister wears a hijab, but I no longer consider it a feminist choice because it's something that is imposed just on girls and women. And women veil for different reasons, but I believe that when something is just imposed on girls and women, it is not a feminist thing. And I believe in equality and rights for everyone.
Thank you. I'm conscious we've gone over the time. There's so many questions, so I'll go to the very last question on, a, on a, an up note. Since the Arab Spring, are there any nations, such as perhaps Tunisia, that might be hopeful models for democratic change and the advancement of women's rights? There are actually many, many great examples that give me hope, and, and that's probably going to go into my second book. So maybe I'll come back in two or three years and tell you about my second book. But um, I'll start with a, an example that gives me a lot of hope from Egypt, my own country, and then I'll go to Tunisia. Because I went to Tunisia, because I, I made it, I produced, well, I reported and I had a producer with me for a BBC World, World Service radio documentary on women in the Middle East and North Africa. And I went to Tunisia to report for this. So I've been to Tunisia many times. But in Egypt, in April, just before my book came out, in the US, I got an invitation to speak at a TEDx conference. Now, some of you might know TEDx. There's, there's the TED conferences, and the TEDx conferences are the local versions of them that people hold locally. So there's a university in, in northeastern Egypt called Zagazig University. And the town of Zagazig is very conservative, but not only is it conservative, it's also the birthplace of Mohamed Morsi, who for a year was Egypt's first elected president after we got rid of Hosni Mubarak. So Mohamed Morsi came from the Muslim Brotherhood, and this town of Zagazig is very conservative and dominated by Muslim Brotherhood politics. So when I was invited to go and speak at this TEDx event at the university by the students, it was organized by the students, I jumped at the chance because I thought this is a great chance to go and speak outside of Cairo because often these kind of events and, you know, in the, in the capital we can always talk to each other about things and we forget that there are cities around the country that are often much more conservative and, and where the message is often quite different. But, but I, I, you know, I said yes immediately and I went out there and I, and I met with, uh, first I met with this student, no, no, when, when I first said to him, um, thank you for this, this invitation, of course I will come, he wrote to me and he said, thank you for accepting to come because my community needs a feminist like you. This is a 19-year-old Egyptian man from a very conservative town where the Muslim Brotherhood has dominated politics for years. That gives me hope. This young man is the future. This young man is what is going to take our revolution forward. Not me, I'm 48. I mean, hopefully I'll be able to do something, you know, for the rest of my life. But the real change, the, 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 that fight against the, so, the social and the sexual, that, that fight against the Mubarak on the street corner and the fight against the Mubarak in the bedroom, that's going to be fought for and won by 19-year-olds. Because that, that, that's a long, long struggle. How long did it take for this country to succeed? And has it succeeded in its sexual revolution that was begun by women like Robin Morgan and Gloria Steinem? I, I just said the Christian Brotherhood in this state has managed to shut down how many reproductive rights clinics? The sexual revolution is still very much being fought along the front lines right here. So imagine what the fight is like in Egypt. So to get an email from a 19-year-old Egyptian man telling me, thank you for coming to my community because my community needs a feminist like you, was like a dream come true for me. So of course I went. So that gives me hope. And going to Tunisia, Tunisia, I would say, has probably made the most progress in their revolution. But their revolution is stuck too, because they too need a social and a sexual revolution. Because even though on the surface Tunisia appears to be a bit more progressive than Egypt, and even though they've been more inclusive in their politics, in that they've included the Islamists and the secular parties, I am convinced no country in the region, no matter how fierce their revolution, no country is going to make any progress unless that social sexual revolution is part and parcel of that revolution. And in Tunisia, the same hang-ups about women's rights to, to sexual freedom, the same hang-ups about women's ability to move in and out freely and safely in public space. So, Clearly, Tunisia needs a social and a sexual revolution. So the entire region ne recognizes that. But there are activists on the ground that many of us outside of the region don't see. I was in France last week, and I was on a television program with a Moroccan activist who, since 2009, has been engaged in that revolution on the ground, unbeknownst to many people in the region and outside the region. So in 2009, for example, she openly identifies as atheist which in and of itself can get you in jail in the Middle East and North Africa. We have had, uh, uh, in Egypt, we've had what I call a morality crusade against gay men, transgender women, belly dancers, and atheists. And that's because of our fasc fascist dictator, Abdel Fattah Sisi, who was now America's best friend in place of Mubarak. That's why I keep saying we're stuck between a dictator from the military and the Muslim Brotherhood. And I'm determined to bring both of them down, because I want neither. So this moral crusade 
that is across the region that, that has all these people going, this is a, a, a woman from Morocco who openly identifies as atheist. That in and of itself can land you in jail. In 2009, her group staged a public break of the fast during Ramadan. That is illegal in most countries in the Middle East and North Africa. You'll be arrested on the spot. She was doing that in 2009 before the revolutions. She is now fighting for the rights of the LGBT. There, is, uh, the, there was a, um, recently in Tunisia, and that's why I say the social sexual revolution is really what counts. Tunisia recently gave a license to an LGBT group, which I think is a great step in the right direction. And there was a pride parade in Morocco, which, and in Istanbul, Turkey, which many people don't know about. And we, we have gay rights activists in Egypt, but they have to be very, very careful because of this crusade against gay men in Egypt and the atheists and belly dancers, etc., etc. So whenever you see countries engaged in these moral crusades, and that's why I talk about the Christian Brotherhood here and the Jewish Brotherhood in Israel, moral crusades are often crusades that are conducted by people who are worried about their position of power. They are worried that they're losing power. And the easiest way to assume power is to control women's bodies through reproductive rights and to control the rights of sexual minorities. That's the easiest way that you gain yourself power. You say, I'm gonna start arresting gay men, I'm gonna arrest belly dancers, I'm gonna shut down abortion clinics. That's what connects Egypt and the US right now. Thank you very much, Mona. I have to say, it takes guts to do, to stand up here and say what you say, not just in the South. I've, le I've lost a few people, You've I You've lost see. a few people, but I suspect it takes, well, actually, I know it takes far more guts to do what you do and say what you say in the Middle East, and I, I applaud you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much for staying over time. Just Please? Sure. Um, can I, I just wanted to say to you all as you leave, thank you very much for coming and thank you for staying. And please remember that women's rights in this country are still very much a necessity. So let's call this a global struggle for women's rights and keep fighting. Thank you.